Hello, my name is Pete Radcliffe, and today on Sunday, August the 17th, I'm interviewing Elizabeth Zirkoff, the Projects Director of the Israeli NGO Hotline for Refugees and Migrants, and a prominent activist as well in the um, anti-war movement and against the occupation of Gaza. Um, first, first of all, Elizabeth, um, could you just tell us something about your campaigning work? So, uh, the Hotline for Refugees and Migrants uh, was established in 1998. At the time, it dealt mostly with migrant workers who either came here on tourist visas and overstayed them, or people who were invited into Israel to replace Palestinian workers. Uh, and they were, and still are, treated uh, simply as kind of uh, working hands, people who are denied most basic rights. Um, being a migrant worker here even for five, ten years does not guarantee you citizenship at any point. You are expected to leave once you are not needed anymore. Um, then uh, when the wave of African asylum seekers began arriving in Israel in about 2005, 2006, um, and until now they became the our largest focus. Um, Asylum seekers in Israel, unlike in any other Western countries, are detained indefinitely uh, in a desert camp uh, called Cholot. Um, they are pressured in those detention facilities to leave Israel, to agree to, le to leave, because deporting them would be illegal, it would be against Israeli law and international law. So what Israel does instead is lock people up indefinitely and then tell them to um, pressure them to sign documents saying that they're living willingly. Um, and uh, at the same time, Israel's asylum system, the system that examines refugee claims, is extremely unfair. We have the lowest recognition rate of refugees uh, compared to anywhere in the Western world. Uh, only 0 0.15 asylum requests are accepted. Everything else is denied. Uh, this is compared to, for example, in the U.S., it's 55%. Um, the populations that we're dealing here mostly are Eritreans and Sudanese, who are f fleeing uh, persecution, um, uh, prolonged, uh, basically endless uh, slavery service uh, for the regime of Eritrea, uh, the, the genocide in Darfur, etc. Um, another group that we help are human trafficking victims. Uh, we were among the groups that basically led to the almost complete uh, elimination of human trafficking for sex work in Israel. Uh, Israel used to, uh, used to be a hub of uh, human trafficking. Uh, thousands of women would be trafficked into Israel each year. Uh, now this uh, phenomenon has been abolished. Um, but we are still dealing with uh, people who've been trafficked uh, into Israel for the purpose of work that isn't sex work. So that's another group that yeah. we focus on. Um, uh, could I ask what your observations are of the anti-war movement in Israel? And um, how can it turn around a situation where right-wing nationalists and even racist ideas seem to be deeply entrenched? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. And it's... Um, uh, I, I honestly uh, don't feel too hopeful. The, the, in Israel, there's a difference between being anti-war and being pro-peace. Anti-war is something that um, is almost entirely uh, the protest, the, you know, the discourse comes mostly from non-Zionist non uh, Israelis, uh, whereas the pro-peace camp is much, much larger. Uh, but the pro-peace camp uh, usually stays mostly silent during, during wars uh, because no one wants to criticize the government during the time of war, no one wants to criticize IDF soldiers during the time of war. Um, and the result is that the anti-war movement is quite small um, and is very much seen as kind of a group of traitors. Uh, we are... our voices don't... Um, are not presented in the mainstream media except in a way to kind of ridicule us, to kind of show that there are crazies on both sides. Um, so we definitely face a, a, a very, very significant challenge because we're a small group, uh, whereas uh, the forces against us are much larger and enjoy much better access to centers of power, to the government, to the education ministry, uh, the educational system in Israel, 
produces this cadre of uh, militaristic and nationalistic kids, uh, and they have much better access to mainstream media, and mainstream media is much more sympathetic to their views. So we are definitely facing an uphill battle here in Israel. Um, surprisingly, unfortunately, over the last two days, it looks like the Israeli government may enter into serious negotiations, as well as Hamas call off their attacks indefinitely. How far do you think these negotiations will go? And uh, is this only buying time for Netanyahu? Can the anti-war movement in Israel be able to exploit these problems? Well, I think um, the negotiations right now, it's really hard to tell uh, where they'll be leading us. I'm sure that uh, uh, Israel will never allow kind of seaport or an airport to be built in Gaza while it's under uh, Hamas control. Uh, this is something that is unacceptable to 99.9% .9 of Israeli Jews in, in Israel, and it will just not happen. Um, I think that the, all the issues in the agreement that appears to be shaping up right now, all the issues that are being deferred, basically Israel hopes to kind of uh, um, make them go away with time. Israel, for example, in 2005, in, uh, in an agreement that brought uh, the EU into the crossing between, uh, between Egypt uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Gaza, uh, Israel committed itself to helping, uh, allowing uh, aid to enter Gaza to allow the rebuilding of the seaport. Uh, and it never happened. So Israel is hoping to do the same this time too. Um, the anti-war movement definitely has a role here uh, to try and show Israelis um, that um, we are not, um, that we are in a kind of a tough position because the anti-war movement basically supports the demands made by Hamas to lift the siege, etc. Um, and right now when we call for it, uh, it appears as if we're uh, siding with Hamas, and it's absolutely not the case. We're for the Palestinian people, and we want them uh, to live and have access uh, to Israel, access to the outside world, so that they can trade with Israel in the West Bank, etc. And um, the result is that the voices that are uh, coming out uh, right now um, kind of... Um, criticizing the agreement are mostly people more kind of to the more kind of to the Zionist left uh, who are saying look at what you're doing um, the you are showing the Palestinians once again that what is working is force um, Israel refused to negotiate and lift the siege while there was no war now that there is war Israel is now willing to expand uh, the fishing area um, Israel is willing to at least uh, on paper, consider opening a seaport. Uh, so, and I agree with this criticism. Israel clearly shows to Palestinians, and this is the prevalent view among Palestinians, that what Israel understands is only force. And to be honest, I think it's true, unfortunately. When um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, when other Palestinian leaders say, uh, make moderate statements and uh, combat militant groups operating their territories, uh, they are ignored. Whereas when Hamas kidnaps uh, uh, soldiers, when uh, Hamas uh, lobs rockets at Israel, then suddenly we're willing to talk and negotiate. Um, you'll be uh, aware that some support uh, here the call for a total boycott of Israel, what's called BDS. Others of us think that such a general campaign on all things Israeli, or a campaign about boycotting all things Israeli, will play into the hands of both the Israeli right wing as well as the Jewish right wing here. Um, what do you think about the boycott? And if BDS is not the right thing to do, what else can you suggest activists in the UK do? Well, it's definitely a complex issue. Um, one question is what I think is uh, uh, should be done, uh, and another question is um, what is the kind of morally, uh, what is the thing that feels right in terms of morals but may not necessarily be the smartest thing. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, first of all, that 
all uh, all goods produced in settlement on on in settlement on stolen land needs to need to be boycotted, and this is something that is definitely happening in Europe, uh, and I hope that this continues and expands. Now, as for the BDS, you know, it's it's. Um, it's made up of, of, of certain, you know, the boycott, the divestment, and the sanctions. I don't see th th uh, sanctions happening uh, anytime soon against Israel. It would, uh, you know, it would be sanctions. Um, this is a, um, the, the sanctions are something that is um, very far from the current atmosphere in the international community towards Israel. There's a lot of criticism, but sanctions is something that is, um, that I don't see happening anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, I think, um, for example, the arms embargo that the UK is kind of hinting that it will do if fighting is resumed, I think it's, it's, a, it's a clear moral stance and I think it's a very good idea. Unfortunately, most of the weapons that we get are from the US mm. and the US is not about to stop the shipments uh, to Israel, uh, even though I think it's a, it's a very, very necessary step. Um, I, the 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 BDS calls for boycott not of all Israeli goods but of all Israeli goods that are kind of connected to the occupation. Uh, the problem is that in some ways all Israeli firms, unless they make a, a, a very significant effort to not do so, they're connected to the occupation. Uh, for example, banks that serve all Israelis um, offer mortgages to um, to settlers who build their homes in settlements. Um, so, I uh, I personally think that um, the it is very moral to uh, boycott uh, Israeli goods that are tied to the occupation, uh, goods that are produced in settlements. Um, now, whether this is the smart thing to do, I'm not so sure about it because it can definitely trigger a reaction in Israel that the whole world is against us, everyone is anti-Semitic, we, uh, we only have ourselves uh, to count on. Uh, this is a kind of reaction that we see in many countries that have been subjected to sanctions. Uh, on the other hand, it could trigger a kind of rethinking uh, among the Israeli public, or, or, and even if not a rethinking, a kind of uh, finally Israelis um, uh, paying the, the price for uh, the occupation. Um, so I think every person needs to do what feels uh, right to them. Um, I personally don't buy goods produced in settlements. When you live in Israel, it's impossible to practice BDS because um, I live here. I mean, I if I if if I uh, um, if I uh, apply BDS to my life, I wouldn't be able to live here. Um, but um, but I think that. Um, uh, certain companies, uh, for example, companies that are involved with the Israeli military, um, with all sorts of human rights violations, they should be the first target of uh, these kind of uh, um, massive boycotts because um, this, I think, will signal to the Israeli public that the whole world is not against us, the, the world is against the occupation. Whereas many other BDS targets are uh, simply companies that to Israelis feel that they are Israeli and you are you are, you are attacking us. Um, the boycott of just Israel and not other human rights violators is anti-Semitic. Uh, so I think um, I would urge um, people in the UK to first of all boycott settlement goods and any other goods that have. Uh, you can judge by yourself by reading about the company. Uh, any kind of serious connection to the Israeli occupation to the Israeli military. Thanks for that. I mean, just a, you've already answered this substantially, but I wondered how much is anti-Semitism played by the Israeli government as being the policy of what they're up against in the, poli the solidarity movement with the Palestinians? Um, definitely anti-Semitism is presented as kind of uh, the reason uh, Europe hates us. Um, not, uh, you know, simply in opposition to the fact that Israel is the only democracy to hold an entire nation under, mi under military rule. Now, um, 
I myself think that anti-Semitism definitely has a role inside the Palestinian solidarity movement. Um, we, so, we see it in chants made by supposedly pro-Palestine protesters that are in fact simply anti-Semitic. Um, we see it um, in, um, in the way Israel is singled out compared to other human rights violators, people who come out to protest against the war in Gaza, for example, don't come out uh, to protest against um, injustices elsewhere. So there's definitely a lot of hypocrisy. I don't deny that. But at the same time, I think that anyone who honestly cares about um, Palestinians and wants um, their lives to improve and wants the draconian military rule over them to end, I welcome them into my camp. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't welcome people into my camp who are motivated not by love of Palestinians, but by hatred of Israel or hatred of Jews. Thank you. Um, what's your assessment of the state of the Israeli labor movement um, and its role and potential role in anti-occupation and social justice struggles? And uh, do you have a view on the left of history initiatives like Wackman? So. Uh, the labor movement uh, in Israel, the largest kind of labor organization, is basically part of the state, the Histadrut. Um, they have absolutely no role in the anti-occupation movement. Um, they don't even have a uh, role in the struggle for labor rights in Israel, to be honest. Yeah. Um, they, the strikes that they organize are mostly, the, and the agreements that are reached following those strikes benefit mostly the people inside the government who uh, already receive uh, kind of hefty salaries. Uh, they don't um, concern uh, people at the bottom who uh, are kind of work through private contractors or people who are at the bottom and are just not earning much. Um, so this is an organization that is truly not concerned with labor rights. Um, it's simply another tool of maintaining uh, the control of the wealthy inside the government, uh, the wealthy and the powerful. Now, as a result, because of the, the labor the kind of leading organization uh, in Israel um, for uh, supposedly labor rights because it's kind of uh, morally bankrupt, uh, there are uh, new initiatives. The largest one of them is Koch Lovdim, Power to the Workers. Um, they have um, kind of collectively bargained and unionized uh, thousands of people. Um, and they, I think, are very, very positive force. Um, they, all the people uh, who are kind of lead the organizations are very clearly uh, leftist and are against the occupation. However, the organization itself uh, does not attend uh, anti-war uh, protests, uh, does not kind of uh, call for an end to the occupation. At least I haven't heard anything like that. Um, I still think that they're a very, very positive force because they're actually helping uh, workers in Israel. Um, now, the organization you, that you mentioned, uh, Wakman, uh, it's um, uh, kind of a, a cl kind of a, the classic model of a labor organization. It's a Jewish Arab labor organization. It's very strongly anti-occupation. It participates in every anti-war protest. Um, I think it's a very, very positive organization. Uh, the problem is that it's quite small. Uh, I don't know how many people they're representing, how many people they unionized, but I'm assuming that it's um, uh, hundreds, not thousands. Uh, and even if thousands, then it's not uh, kind of uh, over 10,000. Uh, but they're a very, very positive organization, and uh, I certainly um, uh, urge you all to support them in any way you can. Opponents of two states on both sides accuse the other nationality of being insincere about uh, stu two states. Are there links or any possibilities of links between anti-war activists in Israel with Palestinians who are genuinely enthusiastic for a two-state solution? And do you think such links can alleviate the fears in both communities that currently undermine campaigning for two states? So, the... Many of the people who are in the anti-war movement are people who don't support the two-state solution. They support a binational state, a binational democratic state. Um, I personally don't think that this solution is realistic in the short term. Uh, in the long run, I definitely want a kind of world without borders and nations, but I think right now if you put... Um, 
uh, two nations that hate each other, uh, the Palestinians for a very good reason, Israelis because to justify the occupation to ourselves, uh, you know, Palestinians are kind of presented as dangerous and uh, uh, kind of in a very kind of racist caricature way. Um, uh, there are uh, people on both sides who definitely want the two-state solution. In fact, uh, polls show consistently that most Israelis support the two-state solution and most Palestinians support the two-state solution. Uh, th the problem is that on both sides, uh, the governments have... Uh, have con I mean, in Israel, the government convinced Israelis that the other side is not interested in peace. Uh, and they present all sorts of uh, claims that they rejected uh, the very generous offers that we've made, etc. Although the, the offers were not generous and are very, very far from the minimum demands of the Palestinians, which are the kind of a, a state within the 67 borders and with uh, slight changes to borders. Um, and the... The Palestinians who support peace honestly f have every reason to feel that um, that Israelis don't want peace uh, and that the government doesn't want peace. I mean, uh, Netanyahu has been dragging his feet. He's the only prime minister who basically gave up on the idea of reaching peace with the Palestinians in the last two decades and is instead kind of just trying to manage the conflict um, until we don't know what. Basically just preserving the status quo. So the problem is that people on both sides who support this two-state solution feel that it's not achievable um, in, the short, in the short run. And what um, people like myself try to do is convince people on the Israeli side that peace is possible, that we do have a partner in peace. For example, the new kind of reconciliation government between uh, Fatah and Hamas adopted a kind of very moderate stance uh, supporting negotiations with Israel, and we definitely try to show that to people. The problem is the Israeli government treated this government as a kind of um, uh, a way to officially end the negotiations and deflect uh, international pressure uh, from negotiations by saying, oh, this is a Hamas government, even though no Hamas members are uh, ministers in this government. Mm. Are there any links with any Palestinian organizations uh, with the anti-war movement? Um, definitely, there's um, a lot of work with Palestinian organizations. Um, the, the, the problem is that, uh, and there are actual Palestinian activists within those organizations. Uh, the problem is that due to the restrictions on movement, um, Israelis and Palestinians are really, really separated. Uh, you know, the West Bank, um, it's very hard for Palestinians to get permits uh, into Israel. And anyone who is kind of a critical of the Israeli government, overly critical of it, uh, just won't get a permit. Uh, so we see this kind of um, cooperation, mostly in protests uh, in the West Banks, to which Israelis travel and enter areas uh, illegally, basically, um, to protest with their fellow, with the Palestinians against the occupation. We see it really on a, on a weekly basis. Great. Okay. Uh, are there any further thoughts you'd like to share with us um, today? Well, I think, I first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who came uh, and uh, listened to my talk. I, I think Israel is getting away with what it, it's doing to the Palestinians, mostly because um, um, the vast majority of people in the world are simply unaware and uninterested in the issue. Um, and I honestly think that if there is international pressure in Israel, it doesn't even need to be, uh, you know, serious sanctions, uh, even initial steps, um, uh, even embargoes, even uh, steps like recalling ambassadors, um, even even serious kind of statements uh, that are backed up with kind of threats for further action can pressure the Israeli government into ending the occupation. Because the anti-war movement in Israel is, is weak and because um, the pro-peace camp, uh, many uh, people who support peace feel that it's not achievable in the short term, 
there is no pressure on the Israeli government from within, there is no significant pressure on the Israeli government from within to end the occupation. So uh, unless Israeli society changes, and we're definitely working on that, uh, we really need help from the people around the world to pressure their governments into pressuring our government to end the occupation. Otherwise, I see this continuing and the demographic uh, trends inside Israel are not, uh, are not making me optimistic. Um, young Israelis, uh, polls consistently show that young Israelis are much more racist and much more nationalistic than older people. Uh, polls consistently show uh, that uh, the sectors in Israeli society that are growing the fastest, the ultra-Orthodox, are not pro-peace, they're not interested in it at all. Um, so we definitely need pressure from outside to force the government to end the occupation, to be, to stop being the only kind of supposed democracy to still, con to still enforce military rule over an entire nation of millions of people. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth Zerkoff, who I said was Projects Director of the Israeli NGO Hotline for Refugees and Migrants. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Bye-bye.